So the message today we're going to look at, it's kind of uh, piggybacking on the past few weeks that we've been looking at this concept of having a fresh start. So a fresh start with COVID uh, lifting, the restrictions lifting, uh, and then I think in June we're going to have statewide, um, you know, full uh, restrictions being lifted uh, in the state. So that's going to open up businesses, that's going to open up opportunities for us to resume normalcy. Uh, so we're kind of starting that transition now. Um, my work is, is going through that now where I'm actually hybriding. I'm going to the office twice a week um, and then working from home. So there's a slow transition for us getting back to normalcy. Uh, but, you know, what we've learned to accept is that our normal may not be the normal that we're used to. Although things may be opening up again, there's still changes. Uh, right now, Disneyland is open, uh, but it's, I think, I believe at 25% capacity uh, and you have to make a reservation to get in, which is totally different than before where anybody could just walk in. So there's a lot of changes going on around us, a lot of changes with businesses and uh, a lot of changes with schools and how kids are going to school right now. Who knows what it's gonna look like uh, in the fall when kids go back to school full time? Are they gonna have to wear masks? Uh, are there gonna be glass partitions? Or So there's a lot of things that are gonna be happening. So, so the Saddleback Church has decided that they were going to uh, do this series on on a restart on how to have a better life. Um, and so we're going to carry this on. We're going to continue this. Um, so today we're going to look more closely at how to have a restart in our lives. Um, we all need a renewal at some shape or form, whether it be a renewal relationship, a renewed marriage, a renewed health, a renewed, uh, you know, aspirations and goals, uh, renewed hobbies, a renewed passion for living, renewed career, um, there's different areas you can apply this message. So we hope that this practical message will help you as you're kind of navigating those waters of, of starting fresh. Uh, but bottom line is you don't want to do this process alone. You want to do this with God. And it is a process. We're all in the process of renewal. If you can see in the background of the screen, you'll see there's a butterfly. And as you know, the process of a butterfly starts from, you know, a caterpillar to a chrysalis to a butterfly. So there's a transformation process that takes place. And in the same way, God wants us to do that as well. He wants us to transform to become more like, more like Christ. And this process takes time. And this is a journey that each and every one of us have to go on in our lives, to go on this process, this transformation um, to become more like Christ. So let's look at the first verse. In Isaiah 40, 31, it says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So I think we can all admit that we maybe need this verse right now in our lives. We've been really tired this past year. Um, lack of energy from this COVID, um, this pandemic that we've had to face. But, but how do we claim this promise? How do we claim this promise where God will renew us? and give us strength when we're weak. How, how do we claim this prom promise? So to be in the position to benefit from this verse, it requires us to prepare and prioritize this. Today, we're gonna be studying the book of Nehemiah again, uh, which was a Jewish leader who supervised in the rebuilding of Jerusalem in the mid fifth century BC, uh, when the Israelites came back from Babylon in captivity for 70 years. So, uh, well, actually it was Persia at the time. And after, um, after this time, Israel uh, didn't look the same when they went back into it. The buildings were destroyed uh, for a long time. And, and a lot of people that remembered what it was like before, uh, they got sad. Uh, so let's look at the next verse in Nehemiah chapter one, verses three through four. It says, they said to me, the wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, I fasted, and prayed to God, to the God of heaven. So Nehemiah started a process of rebuilding and restarting uh, Israel, uh, leading the effort for those that were coming together to rebuild um, Israel. So the question is, what is your Israel right now? What, what, what is being destroyed in your life? Is there an area in your life that you feel has, has been destroyed that needs to be rebuilt? Whatever that is, uh, write that down or, or, or make a note of that as you discuss this in your group today, um, you know, to identify that so you can follow these three steps that we're going to give you today. If you have your notes printed out, I want you to circle the word mourn. I want you to circle the word fasted. 
and I want you to circle the word prayed. Those three words are what we're going to be looking at in more detail uh, today um, to give you the steps on how to rebuild. Um, now, we can't choose most of our circumstances, um, but we can choose our response. And that's what we're going to look at today. It's not enough just to have faith, right? You know, I know there's been times where people have been hurt. Maybe we've said it. Just have faith. Just have faith. Or it's been said to us to just have faith. But it's not enough just to have faith. It, 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 it's, it's how to have the faith. That's what we're going to really look at today. How do you have the faith during difficult times where you're rebuilding? Now, let's break this first down. The first fill-in is to mourn. I had you guys circle that word, mourn, which means to express your hurt to God, to express your hurt to God. If you're in pain and you have to, and you're in pain right now, you have to start here. You can't skip this part. You can't just bypass it and go on to moving on with your life. We need to admit, admit our pain. We need to admit that we're hurting right now and not minimize it. Um, you know, it could be affecting us in ways that we don't even realize it. So when we reflect back on this past year, you know, how has COVID affected you? This has been a one year long of isolation and restrictions where there's changes. Some people couldn't go to funerals. Some people couldn't go to graduation. Some people lost their jobs. Some people lost loved ones. So how have you been affected by COVID? Um, are you scared about the future, right? Uh, coming out of this pandemic, what's the future look like? Are you worried about it? Are you worried about regaining financial freedom again or financial stability? Are you struggling with the recurring or bad habit um, right now? Um, are you holding on to resentment or guilt maybe that you've held on to for many, many years that hasn't been worked out? Um, you know, think of mourning as stopping what you are doing in your tracks, stopping you in your tracks and tending to your wounds and allowing your injury time to heal. Mourning takes time. You can't rush this process. It's just, you know, I wish, I wish we could, I wish we could like, you know, uh, just have this quick fix or something that's just going to give us this boom there we're, we're healed. But it doesn't work that way. God didn't design mourning to take place overnight. It takes time. And mourning requires expression, like an outlet. You can't mourn in secrecy, in isolation. It doesn't work that way. And a lot of people were in isolation this past year when they had to mourn uh, the loss of loved ones in their lives. So don't mourn alone. Turn to others you trust and turn to God. He specializes in comforting us during our morning times. Let's look at the next verse in Matthew uh, chapter five, verse four. It says, God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. This is one of the Beatitudes. So why do you think this is? Why do you think God comforts us when we mourn? Because he loves us. He's our father. He cares about us and he's with us and he feels with us. God hurts with us and wants to comfort us during our difficult times. And God doesn't want us to escape, although we tend to want to escape. Uh, he doesn't want us. He, he doesn't want us to escape. He wants us to face it, and he wants us to heal from it, and he wants us to be stronger from it as well. Now, when we don't claim this verse, when we don't turn to God to comfort us and mourn, uh, we tend to look for satisfaction from unhealthy things uh, like addiction, right? We've talked about that before. Um, if we don't mourn, our human nature will we'll take over and we'll look to something to distract us from true healing. We will look for that quick fix, right? You know, uh, Pastor Tom said it best. He said, Southern comfort is no comfort at all, right? <laughs> it's no comfort at all. We need God. We have to mourn his way. Um, and that's why programs like Celebrate Recovery are so successful because it's a program that promotes healing and, and accountability and time. It promotes taking time, the process. It embraces this concept of it being a process. Now, God is the only one that can provide us true, genuine comfort and true, genuine hope when we are hurting. Let's look at the next verse in Psalms 94, 19. It says, when doubts fill my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. And I love that verse, but often our doubts lead us to secrecy and isolation and where we miss out on God's comfort. Uh, we don't get that hope uh, that we need. Uh, we tend to play God in our own lives or be our own doctor, our own therapist, or our own counselor, right? Uh, we can be good at deceiving ourselves 
uh, away from where we really need to go. So maybe we are afraid that facing our pain will cause us more permanent damage as a result, but that's just a lie from the enemy. God wants us to face our pain, to work through our pain and, and, and get healing for it. Let's look at this next verse in Psalms 35. It says, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. So it's saying right there that pain is temporary. If we let God do his work for us, pain can be temporary. It doesn't have to be a lifelong damage, right? Um, and that's what the enemy wants to happen to us. He wants us to, to not get healing for our pain, to have it be an unopened wound constantly in our lives that's affecting all of our relationships. He doesn't want that, or God doesn't want that for us. Pain is temporary if we let God do his work. So God can take our pain and use it for our greatest joy through ministry and serving others. That's how God designed it. He never wastes a pain. God can build our character so much where we begin to look at life and relationships in a better way. We get this new perspective, right? We get this new perspective um, after we've gone through it. People who have allowed God to change them from the inside out, believe it or not, they never wish or they never wish they can go back to their old ways, right? Sometimes they say, I, I'm happy I went through it because it taught me something and I don't want to go back to my old ways. They learned a lesson from that pain. Now there's a joy that is permanent, right? And, and we've seen this with a lot of Christians, a lot of people who've given their testimony. They seem to walk around with this joy that's permanent, that, that's lasting. Um, and, and the reason for that is because God has changed them. He has changed them from the inside out. He's transformed them to be more like Christ. They've recognized that God has given them a strength that they couldn't have received anywhere else. And they chose to rely on his strength for the rest of their lives. That's why they have this joy, because they know that there's something that they have in their lives that can't be taken from them. And that's God. And that's the love and the strength of God. Now, in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, it says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. People are afraid to grieve because they are afraid of being weak, but they don't realize that not grieving is keeping them truly weak. It's one of those paradoxes that, that, that people tend to fall into. It's that trap that people tend to fall into. Our weakness has the power to lead us to God's strength if we choose it, and we have to choose this. Um, now, Paul recognized this in his weakness. Um, you know, when he gave, when he said this quote, when he said this in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, he recognized that in his weakness, that's where he can truly rely on God, that, that people, humans are, are limited. We don't have the ability to solve all of our problems. If we did, we would have already. And there's going to be times in our lives where we're going to be so weak, where we can't even get out of bed, where we can't even function. And God is there to help us in those moments. Um, but Paul recognized where his strength came from, right? He says, then I am strong, but he recognized where that strength came from. There's a quote that I really like. It's from Joni Tata. It says, the weaker we feel, the harder we lean on God and the harder we lean, the stronger we grow. You see that quote? It's really interesting because sometimes when we feel weak, we don't lean on God. That's where we make our first mistake. Our response is we lean on other things. We, we, we lean on a substance or, or, or something to numb our pain, or we lean on an unhealthy relationship or an or a addiction or something that's, that's making us even weaker. But this quote here is very clear. It says, the weaker we feel, the harder we need to lean on God. That's where we truly get our strength. And the harder we lean on God, the stronger we grow. This is a very beautiful quote. It's, it's really a formula for life. It's how God designed it for us. So the question is, when we're hurting and we feel weak, where will we turn next? Will we call someone? Will we pull out our Bible? Will we pull out a Christian devotional? Um, or will we just get alone, get on our knees and cry out to God? You know, so th those are questions. Some people actually turn to music as a way to help them when they're hurting. Um, I'm going to show you a practical tool for those of you that uh, like getting encouragement from Christian music. 
So um, if you see on the screen here, I don't know if you have your notes, but if you don't, I want you to write this down. Actually, you know what? I'm going to put it in the chat box at the end of our message today. It's a Spotify account. Um, it's free. You can actually see a list of, of these different songs on here. And we actually played one of them on there. Uh, the first one, we're going to play a couple more during this message today. But, but this is, music helps, right? Music helps. Uh, my mom listens to Christian music all the time in her car. Um, you know, I have friends that listen to it and it changes their attitude. It changes their day because they actually um, feel better throughout the day with Christian music. Now, Pastor Tom, who, who did this message, made a Spotify playlist that is free. And the link is in your notes. I'm going to give it to you at the end of our message again. Um, there might be a song in this list that really connects with you, that, that you may not like all of them, but there might be a few out of this list that you really like. Um, when that day comes, these songs may help you kickstart you, kickstart this morning process and awaken your feelings and help you get through what you're getting through. Um, these songs are also free on YouTube. You can also search for song Christian songs for the hurting. I'm sure there'll be stuff that will pop up, um, but definitely take advantage of it and look at it because this is a good preparation for us for the future. When we actually have moments in the future that are hurting us, we're gonna need we're gonna need this resource to help us. So let's go to the second one, the second fill-in. To fast, right? The first one, right? So it was to mourn. The second one is to fast, right? Uh, which means to focus your heart on God. That's what it means to fast, right? Many of us think fasting means just not eating, right? Um, that's a form of it, but but that's really not the true meaning of fasting, which is to focus our hearts on God. And whatever it takes to do that, that's what a fasting is. Um, you know, fasting is definitely a way of focusing on God. So in Joel uh, chapter two, verses 12, it says, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting. If you have your notes circle, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So you're doing the fasting and the mourning at the same time. <clears throat> I want you to look at the beginning of this verse. It says, turn to me. You see, fasting is not turning away from food. It's turning to God. That's the essence of fasting. It's not a change in diet. It's a change in activity that will draw you closer to God. Fasting is not self-denial as much as we think it is. Um, let's look at this next verse in Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 23. It says, these rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil. So it's basically saying, if you're going to take fasting the wrong way, and you're just going to in, in, you know, do self-denial, which is talking, what's the saying right there, that's not what it's all about. Fasting is focusing on God. You see, we can't willpower our way through the morning process. It doesn't work that way. We can't force ourselves through an addiction to recovery. It doesn't work that way. Seeking God is the only way. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, it says, So I gave my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting. So that's the whole point. The whole point is to seek God. Just wanting to give more attention to God is not enough. We tend to lose focus, right? We're humans. We tend to lose focus. So we have to intentionally do things to draw our focus on God. And one of those ways is by fasting. Here's a start, right? Instead of doing a fast for a few days, um, we can actually do maybe a one meal fast, maybe lunch or something like that, or, or, or breakfast or dinner or something, and use that time to focus on God, right? If you have dietary issues, you, you can maybe instead of skipping food or skipping a meal, you can actually skip social media for a day, right? I know that's a far-fetched concept in today's world to sk skip social media for a day, but maybe you can do that. Maybe you can take time in the day to not go on social media and use that time instead to focus on God, right? You're not just depriving yourself something, you're replacing it with something better. You see, you can, you can fast even from your phone for a day or even an hour. It doesn't have to be a whole day. You can just fast for one hour and take that time with God where there's, where there's great connection with him. You see, there's a, pro a power in eliminating a distraction, an unhealthy distraction that is keeping you from connecting with God. It, it's almost like 
you can now hear God for the first time, or you can truly be real with God. You're not, you know, looking at other things or, or, you know, your attention is diverted elsewhere. You can focus on God, which is exactly what it's saying in Daniel 9, 3, to seek him, to give your attention to him. Even though today it could be hard to do that. If you eliminate some of these distractions, it can be done. In our day and time, seeking and focusing our hearts on God is not easy, but it's essential for our spiritual growth. Let's look at First Chronicles uh, 22, verses 19. It says, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. This is what we have to learn to do if we are going to get this restart. This is what we're going to have to learn to do if we're going to live the life that God intended for us to live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this message. Thank you for this simple three-step process of mourning, fasting, and praying. It's simple, but it requires work. It requires rechanging our priorities, um, eliminating distractions, prioritizing you, and putting you first in these areas, Lord Jesus. So whatever it is we need a restart in, whether it be a restarted relationship with our family or friends, a restarted career, a restarted passion for, for just living, Lord. Um, maybe a restart in our health. We want to get healthy re or get healthier. Um, or maybe a restart in, in our mental health or, or our spiritual health or our emotional health, Lord Jesus. Whatever that is for each of us, Lord, you know what it is. So I pray that you can reveal it to us and help us through this process of getting this restart, Lord Jesus. So if we're holding on to pain, or wounds, or guilt, or resentment, or or just something that's been unexpressed, Lord Jesus, where we have not mourned. Help us to start this process now. Help us to invite you into our pain, where you can help the healing begin, Lord Jesus. And Lord, if we don't have anybody in our lives that can help walk us through this, that accountability that you've designed for us, Lord Jesus, to not go through life alone, I pray that you bring that person to our life. And if you have, if they are in our life, highlight that person so that we know that that's the person that you want for us to, to go deep with, Lord Jesus. And Lord, help us to learn to fast. I know this is a far, this is not a, a common concept that Christians, that we do, uh, Christians do much today, but Lord, we need to fast. We need to fast from whatever it is that's getting in the way from us focusing our attention on you, whether it be social media, uh, technology, TV, Netflix, um, or just an unhealthy relationship, or whatever it may be, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to fast and to take the time to focus on you so that we can have a stronger relationship and invite you into this process of making us more like Christ. And finally, Lord, I just pray you speak through my mom as she talks about praying and how to do that and the importance of it and the beauty of prayer, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys still there? Yes. Yep. All right, I'm going to play this middle song and then my mom is going to take it over. Okay. Okay. Prayer. Do you str struggle with prayer? Uh, do you pray like you're ordering food? I need this, 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 you know, just like ordering food. Um, do you picture clearly who you're praying to? Um, are you clear with your prayer? Are you vague? Are you vague with your prayer? Are you very clear in what you want? And are you real? Are you really transparent with a pure heart going in front of the Lord? Honest, honest about yourself. We're going to cover these things in these next few points here. So the first one is, number three is pray. Ask for help. Help is your fill-in from God. So you're praying, you're asking for help from God. And in Psalms 28.1, it says, Lord, my rock, I call out to you for help. This alone could be hard for a lot of people, just calling out for help. Or last resort, I've tried everything. I'm going to call out from help from God and see if that works, see if that pays off. But I have found in my past when I have really gotten to the point where I'm down on my knees and I need help, I call out to the Lord for help and he is there. He first immediately, you feel his presence. It calms you, but it has to be sincere, a sincere 
calling out and remembering who you're calling out to. You want to, in your next fill in, recognize, recognize who God is. I have to be honest with you. I don't always picture that. I'm trying to picture that. But this is God, the almighty who created the whole universe, created us, everything beautiful around us, all powerful, majesty. Um, do we picture that every time we are praying, recognize who God is? And in Nehemiah 1, 5 and 6, here's a prayer that, that Nehemiah said. And we're going to go back to this again, but this is an amazing prayer. If you can't think of a prayer to pray to God, here is one, a great example. It said, then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. So he's covering everything here. He is, he is showing God's character who keeps his covenant and love. He is showing how powerful God is, great and awesome God. And he's showing God's awareness, very attentive to what we hear. These are, these are acknowledging, acknowledging who God is when we pray. In fact, a good thing to do when you start a prayer, and I try to always remember this, is when I'm starting my prayer, I will praise God for all the things that I know he has done and who he is. I will praise him before I have my list of prayers because that's reminding me and we could remind you who you're talking to. This isn't just some words you're, you're throwing out there. This is to the almighty. And this is, this is an amazing privilege that by doing so, we are connected. We little ones down here are connected to the father God. And this is absolutely amazing. So connect the help you need with the power of God has to be who you know you are you are talking to and in ephesians 119 i pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him i want to read that again i pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him amen right there you believe him, you pray to him, incredibly powerful. And I've heard so many people, oh, this is beyond prayer or uh, this, is, this is hopeless. There is nothing hopeless because God has created everything. We know this. We know about miracles. We know how we can calm our seas in our heart. We know these things, but we forget it. That's the problem. We, can, we forget it. Now, your next fill-in is confess, confess who you are. Now, what does that mean? That means you, you got to be transparent. You can't go in there and say, Lord, I am praying for blah, blah, blah to help me because everyone else is horrible and, and uh, da, 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 but I know I've, I've been okay and I'm good or start blaming people, other people. You have to be transparent. You have to be willing to look into yourself and who you are. In Nehemiah 1, 6 and 7, it says, I confess the sins we Israelites. So he's confessing even, even his, his family before, family and heritage before. He is confessing that, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, degrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. So he's being, he's confessing. Confessing means actually agreeing with God. So you're not saying da 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 da. I, I'm I'm saying I'm this, but I know it's opposite of what you would say, God. You are agreeing with God. You are agreeing that in this instance they were wrong, or or you are wrong. For instance, I I I've been doing uh, marriage counseling, 
for a while. And it's never, ever a situation where it's 100% one person wrong and the other person is, is a saint. There's always something that we can say, well, if we hadn't have done that and confess that, look, I, I could have aggravated somebody or I've done something that I need to um, confess and, and repent for, change, change my ways, change the way I'm thinking. So always look into your heart. God looks at an honest heart, not just someone who's standing there uh, reading a monologue and uh, God, I want you to do this and da, 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 and not having the heart in there. He wants you to look at who you are and lay it in front of him because he already knows who you are anyway. So he wants you to be transparent. And when you become transparent, the whole relationship between you and the Lord is real. It becomes real. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, but, I, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, cleanse us from our wickedness. So he cleanses you once you... I have never seen anything like it. I've done this in the past I've quite a few times, but when I start to realize I did something wrong and then I confess it and I start to see, I'm sorry, Lord, I could see what, what I did wrong. And I may, I may say it to another person too. The freedom, the freedom you get with this, you're not like blaming anybody anymore. You're not uh, coming off like I deserve this. Uh, it's not about that. It's about, cleansing yourself and the lord can do that but you have to be real you cannot be this facade this this person that you think you'd like to be or you you think you are you have to really look at yourself clearly and if you can't ask the lord to help you help me lord to see me the way you see me help me to prune my heart help me to to purify my mind help me to love others like you love others these are the things that you, you ask for to keep cleansing you and purifying you more. Okay, your next fill in is call on God's promises. And you have to remember and remind God. So call on God's promises. Now, how do you do that? You got to know the promises. There are a lot of promises in the Bible that the God that God has given us. But a lot of us don't even know what they are. We don't even know what to ask for. We don't. E we can't even say, God, you promised this. It, it, it's very helpful if we invest time to read the word and know what God has promised to us. So in uh, Nehemiah 1, 8 and 9, it says, please remember the promise you made to Moses. You told him that if we were unfaithful, you would scatter us among the foreign nations. But you also said that no matter how far away we were, we could turn to you and start obeying your laws. Then you would bring us back to the place where you have chosen to be worshipped. And this is exactly what's happening in Nehemiah because they were gone 70 years to Babylon. They were conquered by um, Nehemiah. Um, you know, I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry. But he were conquered, conquered by that king. And um, they were there. Daniel uh, um, was there for 70 years. He was conquered when he was a teenager and they ended up being in Babylon for 70 years. But now it's time to go back. And um, he's saying that God promised that if you turn your ways, if you repent and you turn and focus back on me and obey, then all of this would be opened up. And sure enough, these things were happening. So you have to look for hope in God's promises. Look, look for specific promises and seek it. Know the Bible. It's back to knowing the Bible. And one more, ask for, here's your next fill in, ask for specific help. The Holy Spirit can help you with that. Ask for specific help. So let me give you an example. It's not like, um, dear Lord, I pray I want to be happy. Thank you. I would just make me happy, allow me to be happy, or I want to, um, I want to have a really good job and uh, very vague, not, you don't want to be vague, you want to be very clear. When you become clear and specific in your prayer, then God specifically can answer you. But if it's very vague, very vague, you're never going to narrow it down because you haven't become clear in your prayer. And Nehemiah 111, he says, oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, 
and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering, revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was the cup. He was the cupbearer to the king. So that's who he was. He was the cupbearer to the king. So you pray for something specific and, and you watch for God to answer specifically and to trust him. So these are clearly things you need to do. Number one, as we go, go through this again, you're asking for help. First, you go to him first. You just don't go last resort. You ask for God for help. You uh, rec recognize who you are praying to. It's not just some words you're throwing out there. You are praying to God, the almighty. And, and to go and pray to God, the almighty, you want to be real. You want to who you are, confess who you are, lay it out there. And then also when you're doing that, know God's promises. Remember them, know them, read the Bible and invest time into knowing what God promised for us. And then very end specific, be specific. Be specific in what you're praying for. Um, and you could be very clear if you go jump up to who you are and you realize what's going on and you recognize who God is, you can be more specific in your prayer. And this becomes more of an intimate, an intimate relationship with God rather than a very vague, superficial one. God, I, I know you're there. I love you. Uh, I, I pray that I will be happy. My kids will be happy. Very vague, very vague. It's like you don't know him, but you want to know him. And that's what the prayer is all about. This amazing connection that we have with the almighty. It's, it's a privilege that I really believe is underestimated by most people. It's more of a task. And I, I, I've got to be honest with you. I've done that too. My prayer lists are so long now. It's almost like I got to get through the list. And I started to realize this isn't, this isn't what the Lord wants me to do. I need to have my heart into every one of them, not like throw out like an order, like ordering food. I need to put my heart into it and know, honor, respect, worship who I am praying to and to be real, real and specific. So um, there's that. Chris, what do we have next? Ooh, 